Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa. Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa. Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa. Homage to him, the blessed one, the worthy one, the fully enlightened one. We pay homage to the Buddha, Sadhu, Sadhu, Sadhu. Did you have enough light? Oh, wait a second. I can fix that. Um, I wonder what that is. I'm missing a light. <laughs> um, there it is. Okay. Okay. That's better. So today we are going to talk a little bit about some suttas. I'm going to really introduce to you a couple suttas we're going to examine. But the topic here is basically how to take uh, Buddhism from the suttas and apply it into life. And so when I'm looking at that, I'm looking at a couple things. You know, I started with a little list and then all of a sudden my mind exploded. <laughs> it's kind of funny. All right, so first of all, um, you know, we can pick suttas that are really useful for one particular thing, but then we can, Stop a minute and we can consider, or we should consider, what are the parts of life that can be contributed to uh, from the teachings directly. You can take whatever it is, the principle that's being taught and, and apply it into that. Wow, then it explodes and you go into, well, when you're talking about life in general, it can apply things to the family. You can apply it then to the community, then to the country, then to the world. Then you can apply using something that is being given in a sutta to working in school or working at home uh, and making everything work more smoothly. You learn a lot about that from the suttas that we teach you in the retreats. And when, you, when we talk here, when we are uncovering these different things, the Buddha is saying that you need to do in order to purify your mind. Well, then you're looking at things that you can use in life. It doesn't just mean school, but it's also talking about college, which is school again, but in all the activities that you do at school. And then for professional uses for uh, things like um, any sort of corporate development, any type of innovation, any type of science, uh, the military usage uh, that the Buddha taught to the stories behind that, some of those uh, medical issues for the body with dis-ease in the body or unease in the mind. And then also for more specific things like when you're having law enforcement problems, then training people to consider things from the angle the Buddha was talking about in creating a much easier life. So in law enforcement training, and also in legal systems and courts and lawyers and attorneys, I've taught lawyers, judges, things like that. And they take these things and it helps them with their jobs. And then sports, competition, sports training, uh, all of that. And even in a simple way, when we talk about you and your own job, if you were working for a company and say you were going to do a proposal to them for a project that you wanted to do, you wanted to create a team for a project, how would you utilize that information to apply it when you were in that job slot? So I used to be a human resources person and uh, basically get people jobs in companies and get people for the companies and companies for the people. So we did a lot of matching up and we learned a lot about thousands of occupations. 
suppose you're in a job and you want to raise, can you use anything the Buddha said in order to get that raise when you go to talk to the boss? Or suppose there is a payment for you for a building program that's in a project that you wanted to do, you could, certain things you can do before you go in there and talk to them that probably almost guarantees that you're going to get the money you ask for. So it's all these things, all these things are involved in actually the Buddhist teaching. Now, when we first apply, what is she really talking about? Well, you can go to the Majima Nikaya and work with that. You can also find little ones in the and. And Gutrunikaya, and uh, you'll find things about Donna and Sheila. And then the Bhavana that we're talking about using the Donna and the Sheila, the Donna's generosity, and the Sheila is the um, moral and ethical behavior. And once you start applying that, it starts to steer your karma. Your karma means action. So the actions you take are influenced by how, how, what you keep in your mind, you know, how you're looking at this in your mind. And so we look at the Eightfold Path, that's an examination of what exactly do you have in your mind from the Eightfold Path? How does it affect you just in your mind and with your behavior? So this is how everything is interwoven. And so it's affecting, it's affecting Donna and Sheila, if you remember, were the things that some people leave them out and go to Sila Samadhi Panya without them. And I think personally, that's one of the reasons it doesn't work out so well. It's because you have to have the Donna and Sheila are foundation blocks for the house. You just can't say, well, I want the house and just put it on the ground and then build it without a foundation under it. Where I come from, if a tornado comes, that means that house turns into toothpicks and it's all over the ground. <laughs> So it has to be hooked to a foundation and it has to be solidly made. And so the foundation of everything is coming. The Buddha is saying, don't skip my Donna, don't skip my Sheila, and don't skip this first bhavana. This understand the bhavana is the development of those for behavioral changes, and but also the development of the mind for the meditation to work. Okay. So we look at that chart at the, at the top, what I had was Donna and then Sheila, and then I had an arrow. It says, oh, that's the comma. It's going to affect the comma, the Donna and the Sheila. Well, how does the Donna affect my comma? <laughs> how does it do that? Well, if I had my drawing board, I just go like this, an arrow like that pointing there. And then I do the other part of the circle like this and another arrow pointing there. So it goes in a circle. And my circle means what goes around comes around <laughs> and that whatever you put out, you get back and whatever you put into a, a job, even if this job is menial labor, I went through a period in my life where I just decided I wanted to do physical labor. And so I was working side by side with people who couldn't do anything else but that labor, but I wanted to do that and nothing else to, to help with the re renovation of some historical homes and the walls and ceilings and floors and the uh, banisters on the stairs, these beautiful banisters. I wanted to do that for a while. So in whatever you put into that effort is going to determine how good of a job it happens to come out. So you have a sloppy painter, okay. And they don't have a lot of knowledge about painting, but they think I can paint, you know, paint, I can paint and I can roll the roller. Okay. So they show up and you just bought 16 drop cloths and explain to them how to put drop cloths on the floor before you paint. So you leave for the weekend. And when you come back, there's just paint dripped all over the floor and the windows and everywhere. And you're wondering what happened. Well, they didn't use the drop cloths. And the big one is that they decided to, when they were building the building, to put the floor in before they did the painting of the walls. That's a big mistake. You make the, you put the, do the painting 
on the woodwork and the walls in a new house before you finally put that final floor down and lay it down because that's just the floors that, that, that doesn't and you don't want to ruin them and over here that means you're dripping on porous marble <laughs> so it's just like why are you doing that you know and why would you why would you put the floors in and then paint the ceiling there's no logic in this so you know you know you you don't <laughs> you paint the ceiling and then you uh, paint your walls the base and then you uh, finish the walls and you can if you're going to use drop cloths you can then put the floor in put the woodwork in and then finish doing it I painted with a, a group of women painters for about four months one time we had a really good business you know because we were really paying attention and nobody has to clean up anything after we get through it's all precisely done and everything especially the windows and the wood in the windows you know everything and we all had this thing with the urge that we wanted to do this particular work all of this is coming from uh, the buddha uh, so let's let's look first i gave you paperwork i gave you paperwork uh, for support i gave you 95 and i gave you number four so i'm going to show you work with 95 first and um, so you go to the to the, um, the page I gave you and just uh, follow the page while I am let's see which one that is. There you go. You know, you, you can follow the page while I am uh, uh, reading it for you. OK, and I think you'll uh, kind of enjoy now the part at the top in the front of 95. Um, you don't, there is a big brag. I love 95 because the first thing that happens is the big brag, bragging that I'm bigger than you are type thing. And it's about a bunch of, of uh, people that came to tell the, the prince or the king, came to tell him that the Buddha was in town and, um, and um, we should have him come to us. And the king said, no, no, it's the Buddha we should go to see him. And then they had this presentation to the king, which I called a big brag. And sometimes I don't want to take the time to read this, but I'll just, I'll explain it to you. But he, they tell you everything about this king, this, the chancellors say you, because of this, because you're such a big shot, you should not have to go, you have him uh, go over there. You should not have to get the wagons and everything and all the people and go over there and see him. He should come see you. But then Chonky was very, very knowledgeable and he turned around and he basically explained, Master Chonky explained his background, which was equal to what the Buddha was doing, just about the same kind of background. So what he was saying to them, you know, we're pretty much equal footing here and I choose to go and see him. So here we go. And then they went. When they got to where the Buddha was, um, they are basically uh, the Buddha is seated and he is finished with his amiable talk, speaking to people as they're coming in. And it goes like this. We're in section 11 of 95. If you're following in the text, it says basically when he was finished some amiable talk and very with very senior Brahmins at the time sitting in the assembly was the Brahmin student who named uh, Kipataka. Kapatika, I'm sorry, Kapatika, the young, young and sh shaven headed, 16 years old. He was already a master of the three Vedas with their vocabularies, the liturgy, the phonology, the etymology, and the histories of the fifth. He already had this in his head. He was skilled in philology and grammar. He was fully versed in natural philosophy, and the, he knew the marks of a great man. And while the very senior Brahmins were conversing with the Buddha, uh, he repeatedly tried to break in and interrupted their talk. And then the Blessed One rebuked the Brahmin, the young Brahmin, and he said, let not this venerable Bharadvaja, which means young student or beginner, you know, the young person, break in and interrupt the talk of the very senior Brahmins while they are conversing, it's not to be done. Let the Venerable Bhardvaja uh, wait until the talk is finished. And when this was said, 
uh, the Brahmin Chanki said to the Blessed One suddenly that let not Master Gautama rebuke the Brahmin student um, Kapatika because the Brahmin student is a clansman, well learned, very learned, and his, has good delivery, and he is wise and he's capable of taking part in the discussion, Master Gautama. And so then the Blessed One thought, well, surely since the Brahmins honor him, the Brahmin student, um, Kapad, Kapatika, must be accomplished in the scriptures of the three Vedas. And he's catching up now who this is. And then he says, the Brahmin student thought, um, when the recluse Gautama catches my eye, I'll ask him a question. And so he starts to drive the conversation in this sutta, really because he gets to start asking questions. So then he says, knowing that his mind, in his mind, that the thought uh, of the Brahmin student, uh, in his mind, the blessed one turned his eye toward him and the Brahmin student then thought the recluse Gautam has turned towards me, suppose I ask him a question. And then he said to the blessed one, Master Gotama, in regard to the ancient Brahmanic hymns that have come down through oral transmission, preserved in the collections, the Brahmins come to a definite conclusion that only this is true and anything else is wrong. What does Master Gotama say about this? And so the first thing he decides to do with this, he decides to uh, basically uh, look at the different ways that you can hear something and accept it and whether you should be accepting it or not. That's where this conversation starts to go. So he says to the young student, among the Brahmins, is there even a single Brahmin who says, I know this, I see this, only this is true, anything else is wrong. And he says, no, Master Gotama. So in reading and studying, he's never seen one that does that. Then he says, Bhardvaja, among the Brahmins, is there even a single teacher or a single teacher's teacher back to the seventh generation of teachers who says, I know this, I see this, only this is true and anything else is wrong. No master Godaman. So he says, this is not what I found while I was studying. Well, how then uh, in the, the ancient Brahmin seers, the creators of the hymns, the composers of the hymns, whose ancient hymns that were formally chanted and uttered and compiled the Brahmins nowadays still chant and repeat, repeating what was spoken, reciting what was recited, which is the Ataka, Bamaka, Vamadeva, Vasamita, Yamatiga, Angarasa, Bharadvaja, Vasete, Kasapa, Bhagu, etc. Did even these ancient Brahmin seers say thus, we know this, we see this, and only this is true and anything else is wrong. And, and the young man says again, no, this is not uh, true, Master Gautama. And so it seems that among these Brahmins, there is not even a single Brahmin who says this, I know this and I see this and only this is true. Anything else is wrong. And among the Brahmins, there's not even a single teacher's teacher all the way back to the seventh generation who says this, and the Brahmin seers, the creators of the hymns and composers of those hymns, none of them, even these ancient Brahmin seers, did not say this. And then he slips into a simile. It's just great. He says, suppose there were a file of blind men in touch, one in touch with the next. The first one does not see, the middle one does not see, and the last one does not see. And so, too, in regard to their statement, these Brahmins seem to be like a file of blind men. The first one does not see, the middle one does not see, the last one does not see. This is why, you see, the Buddha couldn't accept that their answers were there the way he had been raised under this as well. And what do you think that that being so does not the faith of the Brahmins turn out to be groundless? The Brahmins honor this not only out of faith, Master Gautam, and they also honor it out of oral transition, tradition. 
So then what happens is he proceeds to examine the different ways that you can examine things, which is the first thing I listed on this chart for you, out of faith or out of approval or out of oral tradition. And then there's reasoned cogitation. And if you go through region, re, region, reasonable, I'm sorry, reasoned cogitation, figuring it all out, you can go that way, or reflective acceptance of a view. These are the ways that you can do this, different ways of looking at this. And he's trying to get this young uh, Brahmin to understand that um, he's teaching a different way. He's going to find this out in the sutta. So we're going to skip from 14, which is examining the faith of it and his faith enough. And then is approval, uh, just approving it. Now, if everybody approves of it, is that reason to accept it? Or if it's an oral tradition that he just talked about, is that good enough to accept it? Or um, exactly how far should this go? And then what happens, he says, when he has, vesti uh, when he has in investigated this and he has seen that he is um, uh, purifying the states of his delusion, he places faith in it and filled with faith. He, this is what I'm teaching, filled with faith. Um, he visits the teacher and pays respect to him. And having paid respect to him, he then gives ear to him. This is the different way the Buddha is teaching in 20. It's, it's talking to you about the steps of this. And when he gives ear, he hears the Dhamma. He only hears it if he gives ear and he puts everything out of his mind as the only way that you can learn this Dhamma. Otherwise, when you're listening, you're thinking, oh, but I learned this before and this before. And if I put this with that, that would be cool and the rest of it. So you're not going to learn pure Dhamma. You're going to not going to examine pure Dhamma or a pure way approach something like tranquil wisdom and safe meditation. You're not going to just hear the instructions and do it. You're going to sit there and compare it with everything else and mix it up and see if you can be sharper than the guy sitting next to you and go faster or something, you see? And these are the slow students. They're the slow ones. Okay, so he gives ear, he hears the Dhamma. Having heard the Dhamma, he memorizes and examines the meaning of the teachings he's memorized. Remember I told you a couple of weeks ago, memorizing doesn't have to mean the whole sutta either. It, memorization, you're touching on, I'm working on, to say to yourself, I am working on memorization because I know Dana Sila Baba, and I know Sila Samadhi Panya, I know the five aggregates, I know the five hindrances, I know the pre five precepts. I know the three kinds of feeling. I know how craving happens. You see, these th are the things you're memorizing. And so he examines the meaning and then he gains the reflective acceptance on the teaching. He walks around reflecting on how he's learned something. And then when he's gained reflective acceptance of the teaching, enthusiasm springs up with him, in him. People get really confident when they find out this works the way it works, you see. And they want to see more, just the way it's described in the, in the, um, you know, uh, when it says the part about suakato damo sandatiko akaliko e ipasiko, you know, this teaching is easy to understand for the wise. What would the wise mean in this in this situation? The wise person would be the one that's listening to these instructions in Chanti. That's the wise person in this situation. So it's easy to understand for the wise person who follows the right process of learning and using these steps. So these steps are very, very important. And when they do that and something does work and they see some type of insight through the practice at all, it doesn't have to be the final, uh, you, you know, the final um, rebooting of your mind. <laughs> it doesn't have to be that part but it can be way before that. You will become enthusiastic and when that springs up you will apply more will. And when you apply your will, then you will scrutinize very carefully. It means you go back and read it again and you go over it. It's like taking notes and getting ready for an exam. You look at it and go over it again. And then he strives. He starts to practice right effort. Resolutely he strives. He realizes with the body, the supreme truth, 
and sees it by penetrating it with wisdom, seeing it, knowing it by seeing it, sets off the eye of wisdom inside your mind. Sets off, you know that's right because you've seen how it works. And in this way, he says to the young student, there is the discovery of truth in, in this way. One discovers the truth in this way. We describe the discovery of truth, but as yet there is no final arrival at truth. He says, this is the technique we use, but there's no final arrival at truth. And so of course now he's pointing to, he's pointing to the supreme uh, super mundane Nibbana, the, um, the, um, remainderless fading away and cessation of all craving completely. And that is the final step, the arahat. So in that way, Master Gotama, there is the discovery of truth, says the young student. And in that way, one discovers the truth. In that way, we recognize the final, uh, the discovery of truth. But in what way, Master Gautama, is the final arrival of truth? In what way does one finally arrive at truth? We ask you about the final arrival of truth. And this is just like May saying, show me the final arrival of truth. You know, what are these things we're learning in the Buddhist practice and taking them in life? That would be the final arrival of truth. Of, of truth in the usage and application of it in your life all the time. That is what that is what you're interested in. Is that okay? And so now is where it starts at 22, and he says basically the or yeah 21, oh, okay 22. He says in that way there is a final arrival in, in that way there is a final arrival at truth in that way one finally arrives at truth in that way we recognize the final arrival of truth at truth but what is the most helpful way for the arrival of that truth and he starts up here striving is the most helpful thing for the arrival of truth when you start working on this, and this is true with anything you're doing in life, any of those categories that I mentioned to you, if you apply yourself, somebody said to me once, how do you become an expert at something? Well, I didn't realize until I was 50. <laughs> and I decided the only way to become really, really, really good at something is to decide to do it, live it, breathe it, eat it, sleep it, and and open your eyes and see it and constantly go through it. And so what did I do? I got a tiny little trailer with a bed and stuck things on the ceiling and put them on the walls and at the door before I went outside. And when I woke up, read them off to myself until I could force myself to start memorizing. When I started, I thought I couldn't memorize anything anymore. I had had a stroke a few years before and I was all, I couldn't do that. If I couldn't multitask anymore, I could not memorize certainly. And I was figuring out a way to procrastinate that possibly there was a way I could do something useful and I could give something to people that would help them. So I just kept pushing. And then the, if practice, 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 that is how you go from a three speed bike to a five speed to a 10 speed to a 15 speed to a 20 speed bike, 21 speed bike. And you start going road racing and long distance riding on a bike. I did that once too, when I was 51, just for the sake of saying I've done that. I wanted to see what would happen. How far could a person go if they didn't just say, oh, road racing is great, but I don't think I could ever do that. Really? Well, how could I do that? By riding every day, 25, 35, 45 miles, 72 miles, 81 miles, and then 128 on weekends for a road, a road riding for one day, you see? And if you, if you really go to work with it, you would be surprised. Not only what your body can do, if you are putting yourself, getting yourself totally fit to do that kind of thing with a coach the right way, but also the application of whatever it is, you would, you would be, um, you would be surprised. Hold on just one second. Hi, Hi I'm teaching a class. If you want to come in, you can. Or, but I can, and I can talk to you later if you want to, or you can, uh, you want to come in? All right, go to this, just go to this Zoom. I'm inviting somebody in. <laughs> okay, it's 849 6804. 
Yeah, you get your soon. Okay. It's yeah. Okay. This Australian class on Sundays. May, can you let him in? Okay. If he needs to come in, okay. Okay. So now what we're going to do is we're going to take this and we start with striving. And so the point I'm making about striving as the first one mentioned here, okay, and this, if you want to see where I'm going, uh, I'm sorry, yeah. Sometimes when I make these lists, I make them, did I do it backwards? No, we're striving. Uh-huh, right. All right, anyway. Okay, so striving is at the beginning. Striving is at the beginning. And the most important thing that is helpful for the final arrival at truth, he tells the young student, if one does not strive, one will not finally arrive at truth. It's that simple. If you keep, don't keep doing this, whatever it is, you will never become an expert at it. That is why striving is most helpful for the final arrival truth. And then we have the fast famous question every time. He says, but what Master Gotama is most helpful for striving? We ask Master Gotama about the thing most helpful for striving. And then he says scrutiny. And scrutiny is the thing that is most helpful for you to arrive for the ar arrival of striving. That is the thing that will help you most. This is why scrutiny is most helpful for striving. You have to do it. It's simple. You have to do it. <laughs> and people say, well, why is it not working? Well, because when you go through retreat and I see that you can't, when you, well, I give you the six R's and we talk about the six R's and we go through the six R's and you do your practice. And then we, you write me and say, I let go and I came right back or I let go and I, um, I smiled and came back, but you, you're skipping the relaxed step or you're skipping this, the smile step. The two of those are the most important pieces of what's different. Okay. Now here we go. The scrutiny is most helpful for the application of, of will that is most helpful um, for scrutiny the application of your will. You have to put yourself to it and do it. That's the 10th one. Okay. Then zeal, it says zeal, but we change it say enthusiasm, you know, enthusiasm is the most helpful application of will. And if you, if you do that, that is the most helpful thing for the application of your will to happen. And then he says, what's the most helpful thing for the will, the reflective acceptance of the teachings. So you're given the teachings and reflecting on them, reflecting on them feeds your will to do it, okay? And if one does not gain a reflective acceptance of this teaching, if you don't start to experience them and believe in it in that way, then you're not going to feed, uh, you are, it's not gonna be that most helpful thing for real enthusiasm to keep going with your practice, okay? The next one is um, the examination of meaning. And it says, what is the most, accept, uh, the most helpful for the reflective acceptance of the teachings? Your examination of the meaning. So when I teach you or another teacher teaches you, and we ask you to take notes, and then we try to make sure you have just the basic thing in print if we can, that you need to have of what, or follow the sutta as we're going along and take notes, okay? The examination of the meaning is very important, uh, the most uh, for the reflective acceptance of the teachings. Then you take this away and you start reflecting on what you learned, not just reading it. So this again, maybe there is an Ananda in the world right now. When I was uh, in Taiwan during the Vietnam conflict, there were people working in the military, just like Ananda, who could hear something or a group of people speaking on the other side of a wall. And you could be recording it on the other side of the wall and afterwards compare what that person tells you they said, and it would be identical, exact and precise. 
maybe we're not like that. We need to reflect and reflect and reflect. So what is this telling? This reflection, your examination of the, um, your reflect, reflecting constantly on the acceptance of the teachings and what it meant is tuning in to neural cognitive science where they're convinced now that you learn to change the brain's pattern of behavior by repetitiously doing the same thing again and again and again and again. That's how it learns repetition. But the key is you can't just say it nine different ways. It won't work. So if you took somebody and said it and said it and said it, but it's just nine different ways or had nine different people say it their way, the brain would not change. But if the brain hears the exact same thing again and again and again, apparently it has a mechanism where it learns very well and then starts to change the outcome of behavior patterns. So then we have the examination of meaning is the most, uh, is this examination of meaning is most helpful for the reflective acceptance of the teachings. And then the next one is memorizing the teachings is the most effective, uh, let's see, where we go with memorizing the teaching is helpful for examining the meaning, okay? And if one does not memorize the teaching, one will not examine its meaning. So because of one memorizes the teaching, one does examine the meaning. And that's how you support this. So we find that this is the thing most helpful for memorizing the teachings is to repeat, memorize it, repeat it and repeat it and repeat it. The next one is hearing the Dhamma. And we said in order to hear the Dhamma, you have to give ear, which is the next one. Hearing the Dhamma is not, you know, I was, I was in Sri Lanka and I was a bit confused. I had this family that was supporting me and the uh, people, members of the family were there visiting and they're sitting in the living room and there's a major Dhamma talk on a Sunday at the biggest temple and the biggest, most important monk is giving this Dhamma talk on the TV. And so one of them is ironing. The other one is talking with two other people in the other room. And the person in the kitchen comes out to serve things and nobody's paying attention to this at all. It's like, if we hear this happening here beside us, we're going to get something in our head that is going to be Dhamma. It's not cutting it. It's not working. Okay. These are wonderful people. They put a lot of effort into, into uh, supporting the temple, into making uh, this service a utility for the altar, uh, you know, sewing and doing stitchery and tapestry, all kinds of things for this temple that are needed for the community's part of the temple activity. And it's really wonderful. But the point is I couldn't, I didn't want to ask them. I thought I might be insulting them, but I'm standing there, I'm sitting there wondering, you know, why isn't anybody listening to what this person is saying? You know, because he's, one of the most important people who could possibly speak about it, but everybody's doing something else. So that's where giving ear comes in. We are so disoriented to give ear today. We have to have the music playing while we type our schoolwork. We want to have uh, something else going on and something else. We have children that are trying to watch three different programs at one time. My favorite one was this man who had the biggest, um, disc in his yard for the old kind of picking stuff up for TV and had this, you know, clicker and would watch three movies at one time or a documentary, the news and the movie all at one time and be able to tell you, he was a genius. He could tell you what happened in each case, get enough to tell you the whole story. But is he giving ear to anything? He's not giving ear. So that kind of information, what they figured out was that kind of information goes in and maybe you can talk to the people about this, that, and this, you know, a little bit, but you really don't learn it. Learning takes more process to it, okay? And then the most thing for supporting giving ear is paying respect, going and paying respect to the teacher and, um, the only way that you can pay respect to the teacher is by visiting the teacher, right? And so if you don't visit them, you can't do that. So you have to visit the teacher in order to pay respect to them. And then the last one is to have faith 
and perhaps the Buddha did find something and I'm going to go investigate. So when you go in, you don't put up a lot of blocks to figure out, did he find out anything? You put yourself into this process. So going forward, which is the way that I made your list, and we were telling the students and they were coming into the university, let's change all this around. There was a, one of our students who was a professor who took this list and formulated a way to introduce and orient the students in the freshman year into a college. And when he used this as an example of how that university would like their students to behave with any subject they were learning. And he transposed this Dhamma into that is the way to have the perfect student, the perfect behavior, the perfect application of using stuff in life. And he took it. And if you had a university, wouldn't you like someone you chose the university because you had faith in it? And then you started visiting the teachers and you figured out if you gave respect to them and you gave ear to what they were teaching carefully, you would hear the subject. And when you heard the subject, you would start to take notes and carry cards around in your pocket and memorize the teaching. And if you memorize that teaching, that's the way of examining very closely the meaning of that teaching. And then you start having a reflective acceptance of the teaching. You're looking at, if I accept this and I apply it, is it useful for me to remember this information past is some way and then you start getting enthusiastic because you see how you it and apply it so you apply uh, you know put the application of mindfulness to use okay and then you scrutinize the whole situation and you put right effort forward which keeps you training the mind all the time and when you're training the mind all the time you are looking for any unwholesome part of this list you are not doing and putting in the new correct part and keep going with it so this was a system of discipline and it was a system of discipline that was really really accepted very well um, by the people in the community you have any questions on that one? Anybody? Uh, sister. Uh, yeah. What is the difference between uh, uh, scrutiny and, and uh, examination of meaning? Well, when you first are, you're memorizing something, you start to look at what is the meaning of it exactly. Because the best way for you to be memorizing is if you know the mem you know exactly what it means as you memorize it. So just sitting around saying Donasi Labavana, Donasi Labavana, Donasi Labavana, and nobody explains to you what it means, what it's for, or how to do it. So you need more than that. So when you 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 um you're just saying it memorizing it without knowing it, you would just be parroting it. So in India, for instance, in the Sunday schools, predominant system of teaching students which grow up to be adults, which are the children's parents now, everybody can par parrot back to the monk exactly what they taught them. But if you sit and ask them, what does that really mean with a translator or ask someone to talk to them about it, do they really know what it means? And much of it, they do not even know what it means. You see the problem? So examining it first is important. Reflective acceptance of it is accepting it more calmly and not struggling with it. And then the scrutiny, when you scrutinize something, you are scrutinizing exactly each tiny step that you found within the information. And does it make sense to apply it? You're, you're doing that again, but it's at a different level. Is that okay? You understand? One, one is more precise than the other one. Is it here, the you, yeah, here, let's, let's cut it way down and say examination of the meaning is defining it by knowledge and scrutiny. This is reflected you, after you go through reflective 
uh, acceptance of the teaching and your enthusiasm comes up and you you're starting to apply mindfulness to whatever has been taught, then scrutiny, you're, if you are scrutinizing how this worked when you apply it. So this one up here is the, is the knowledge of what it was you memorized. You could say it that way. So you memorize something, but you're just memorizing it. Like if you did, if you did Chichaka Sutta in Pali and you didn't, no one explained it to you step by step, it wouldn't do you a lot of good. But if you understand what I'm saying and I teach you Chichaka, you come out of it with a different perspective. I can try taking things less seriously. Maybe I should first, when anything happens, look at it impersonally before I come become personally involved. Does that make sense for you? Hmm? Yes. Yes. It does. Okay. Okay. Anybody else have a question on this part? Uh, but sister, uh, is scrutiny the same as examination of Dharma in the in the seven factors of enlightenment? No. Different. No. If examination of the Dhamma is opening up a book and reading it and starting to examine the initial sutta, and then you have to go to the reflective, you know, the if reflective acceptance of that teaching, you have to get this thing is I I possibly I'm seeing listlessly may uh, put it in the other order with the the way it worked up there starting that way well we just this is how you come to the teacher up here up here you come to the teacher and the fact is if you don't visit the teacher you won't pay respect to the teacher you have to physically vi visit them getting on the phone or the internet is not it actually go visit them is the real thing giving ear to them is when you listen very precisely Hearing the Dhamma can only happen if you gave ear. So this is a causal relationship to this. Get that? These two here are causally related. Hearing the Dhamma, you cannot memorize something unless you hear it first and writing it down and start repeating it, repeating it, repeating it. But when you're repeating it, repeating it, repeating it, that's what they're doing when they are parroting something. They hear it. You know, um, and they'll say Swakato Dhamma, and the kids will all go Swakato Dhamma, and it's just going bum 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 like that. But they don't know anything. So after they they do that, they have to have a reflective acceptance of this teaching. They have to understand what it really meant. So yeah, it sounds great. And you know, when you're chanting, you have a new a good. Uh, you have a very good vibration and you have a very good frequency because it's wholesome. This is a funny thing. The Davis know what you're saying, but you don't, <laughs> you know, and so they're getting a big bang out of this, you know, but you're trying to say it, but you actually um, are just, uh, you're saying it perfectly clearly, but you don't know what you're saying. See, do you know this story I told you about, this is like, you're talking about, these are the little steps that really get rid of the story. Okay, Bonte was in Thailand. He was at, sitting at the bottom of the steps of a temple and an American came down uh, from somewhere in America. And he said, oh, you are an English monk, speaking monk. And Bonte said, yes. And he says, I have memorized the sutta. Would you listen to it? I can do it in Pali. And, the, and, my, and my teacher said, sure, go ahead, do it for me sat there carefully, listened to him, and it was not a long one. It was nice and clear and perfectly stated, perfectly enunciated, perfect poly. And then he did something just outrageous. My teacher did something just outrageous. He looked at the man and he said, that's very good. What does it mean? And the man went like this. <gasps> what do you mean? What does it mean? Did you not hear the tonality? Did you not pick up on the vibration? Did you not feel the, the sound was taking you and enlightening you? And Bonte said, oh, I'm sorry, but you know, you went to a lot of trouble to do that. You should have just said banana, 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 banana. And that would have taken you to enlightenment. You see, because it's not doing you any good if you do not understand it. That's why these pieces here, 
the effort to memorize it and then examine what you're memorizing and really have a reflective acceptance of that teaching that it fits together. You have examined it and you see the causal relationship inside it and that then you get excited because you're beginning to get it. See, if you're if you're working with me, you come here, you have the jigsaw puzzle in a box and you might have all the pieces together, uh, all the pieces in the box, not lost any of them, but you lost the picture of the puzzle on top of the box. And you have no idea how to put this puzzle together without following the picture on the box. I don't know if you've done jigsaw puzzles, but when you go start to do jigsaw puzzles and put them on the card table and put them together, they come like this, 5,000 pieces, 11,000 pieces, 15, 25,000, 50,000 pieces, these tiny, tiny little pieces, you know, and you better have the picture on the box or it could take you forever to get this thing together if you could ever do it. You see, you go look in a store at jigsaw puzzles and you'll see what I mean. So what we have is a situation where a large, not everybody, but a large portion of Buddhists have no idea what it is they're saying when they memorize chanting in Pali and don't find out what it really means. That's what all this is about. And he's saying, he's really, he's, he's talking about knowing something by experiencing it and seeing it, by seeing it and knowing it. Knowing it by seeing it is what it is. Knowledge and vision turns into knowledge and wisdom. Knowledge and wisdom can never happen if you want to build the house without the foundation and just put it in the field, it will blow away. Understand? If you take it a house structure and just put it there and you have not built a foundation and the foundation is finding out what everything means, it's putting the jigsaw puzzle together. Okay? Make sense? So we try to do that with the minimum amount of information you need so that you can succeed in what it is you're doing when you're practicing. I wanna show you guys something. Wait a second, let me, um, let me find this for a second. Um, I wanna show you what I mean by a minimum amount of information and I think I can do it if I go to, um, mm -hmm. Here you go. Okay, this is a training capsule fundamental section in one of the booklets we were trying to write in order to teach you. So this is trying, we're trying to get across to you. We just give you a fundamental foundation, not the whole foundation of Buddhism, but as a meditator, you need to know just the foundation. Yeah, May. Uh, Sister Kema, sorry to interrupt, but are you sharing a different document now? Yeah, this is, I'm sharing a different one up on the screen. Uh, we're still looking at the uh, Chanki Sutta one. Oh, what happened? You're not tuned into my screen? Uh, we are. Um, Why can't you see it? Wait, I think you should. Un oh, no, wait it. a second. I'm sorry. I, I got it. I know what I did. Hold on a second. I can fix it. I know, I know, I know. <laughs> okay, wait a second. Um, I know, you know, I know, you know, I know. Okay, thank you. Uh, wait a minute, I have to bring it up on the screen. How did I do that? Go back here and bring up, where, which one? This one, there you go. You got it? That's it, right? So when we're telling you, we're trying to, what did we do? What did Bhante Vimala Ramsey do? He went back and he defined mindfulness so that you weren't, didn't have to go in a big deal. Oh, what is mindfulness? Oh, it, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Well, mindfulness, we're going to say in this practice, mindfulness is observation, period. It's a skilled observation that allows you to examine things. Okay. So that's that one. Then we said, okay. What is Buddhist meditation? The meditation itself is an effort to see clearly the true nature of everything. That's what it's about. How does everything work that you experience in life? 
how does it all work? And then we, 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 had, we should have mindful, mindfulness, okay, and the meditation. So the meditation is using the, the mindfulness, the skill all the time. The meditation is, how, is, is happening so that you can see how everything works. The mindfulness is actually special quality remembers some things we hear that a lot but usually people don't tell you what it remembers but what it remembers is it remembers to help us uh, to help us with what we need to do when a distraction pulls us away from our object of meditation or from our daily task, it, we learn to watch our, our distractions operate. And we, this is what it's doing. That's what it's supposed to be doing. And how is it doing it? It's using this mindfulness to see when it has to do it. You understand? Yeah? Okay, so those two are tied together. They're causally related. Meditation without mindfulness is silly. And actually, if you go out in life and you're just playing, being mindful of what's happening here and there and everywhere, that's not gonna help you because it has to be attached to the meditation practice. You see? Okay. Okay. So that's what we tried to do. So we look at what this is. It consists of the four noble truths. Here are your four noble truths. I might leave this up here to look at again in a minute. And then what we have are how you use those four noble truths specifically. Then it has dependent origination that you learned about in a retreat, right? Okay. And then with it has the 37 requisites of awakening is what it's going to be the, the whole pro, the whole clump of the core of the teaching. So what are they? It's four, four, five, four, five, seven, eight. That's how you remember it. Four foundations of mindfulness, four bases of spiritual power, five faculties four steps of right effort and right striving. Sometimes they call it right striving. Five powers, which are the faculties, and they turn automatic. They're happening automatic balance. And the seven factors of awakening come into perfect balance. And at that time, at that time, that is when uh, you are ready to go into the deepest level and go through cessation. And the eightfold path, the factors of awakening have to come into balance before you can actually fall into cessation. That's why these are really important. We have some diagrams to show you how that happens when we're teaching you um, in class sometimes. And then we show you the how to have everything be harmonious. And then the, the whole teaching is we wanted to put it on one page and everybody laughed at me. But here it is. This is it. Okay. So the first one is you have to know you have five aggregates. The being is made up of five aggregates. Most people don't realize that, you know, and the six sense doors are how you experience everything. And the three kinds of feeling are what you need to be familiar with first, pleasant, painful, or neutral feeling. Then you have the three lines of training to start with, the generosity. Why do you do generosity first? Because you soften and open your heart so that it's in the right, prepared in the right way to have successful meditation. You have to have an open heart that is receptive. So if you have something block in your heart, sometimes we have to do forgiveness for a little while to unblock the heart. But if you had the feeling in your heart, you're pretty clear then what happens is you're fine. And you, you, this is what the Donna, this is what the generosity is about, rebalancing the heart. And then the five precepts are here and the five uh, hindrances are here. And the five precepts are working as an umbrella to protect you from these five hindrances. So the five hindrances were important. And then the bhavana, the bhavana that's the most important to you for the development of mind and the behavior is the, pro, is the use of the right effort during your development, which is the six R's, but we show you how it's related to right effort because that is everybody knows, um, you know, identifies it. Recognizing unwholesome mind states, releasing unwholesome mind states, relaxing tension in your mind, 
bringing up wholesome mind states, re-smiling and returning, and then keep the wholesome states going. So the first two of these, what those are doing, they are purifying your mind. The second two are retraining your mind. That is what is important to always see in this thing. The, it, to do the first two again and again, I mean, to do the first two again and again, does not does not cut the does not cut it. Okay, you have to do all four to progressively change the behavior patterns to a different way of behaving. Okay, okay. Then the next one is. This Buddhism, we have to understand that Buddhism is principally about change. It is about change. It's not a dogmatic type of religion. It's, it's something that is progressive and it's about changing your life. A gradual teaching, we're told it's a gradual teaching, gradual practice and a gradual progress that's bringing relief from suffering. You can find that in 107 in section three, okay? And then the... Um, The more you practice, the calmer um, you become. Calmer, that's a new word. <laughs> the calmer, happier you become. When you change your mind, you change your life. This is a fact. And relief happens when wholesome mind states replace unwholesome mind states and direction. And the mindfulness keeps the observation going. So this all here, this is all connected. All of it is connected. And it turns out if you have this in line, you can practice and you will just move right along. Okay, the Noble Eightfold Path, what is it? Supports the journey. It's a support structure and it's a protector after you leave the retreat carries forth. The folds support a wholesome life. We seek impersonal, harmonious perspective and thoughts and communication and movement of the attention, mind's attention, we want to be aware of it, and our lifestyle quality, and that supports our ability to pursue progress in your spiritual development. Practice, you have to have place for practice, even if I've had people in some beautiful places where they just put a screen across the corner like that. And what is behind the screen here is their altar. And they walk behind that little screen in the living room and nobody bothers them. That's it. Big families and anybody back there is there. They light a little light on top and everybody pays respect to that. See? And the 10th one is the daily life practice is to purify and retrain mind, never minding unwholesome thoughts, bringing up wholesome thoughts, keeping them going for a new coexistence that leads to peaceful innovation in the world. So that's what we should be doing. We should be, uh, you know, paying attention to stuff like that. So we take this one off. Any questions about this? Okay, so basically this is why he, when he, we spent a year probably condense, 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 condense. It was like a game and finally got it down to this page. And then we put the meditation, mindfulness and the stuff about the dependent origination, which includes the three characteristics. Because if you learn dependent origination, you automatically understand the three characteristics very, very deeply. But if you just if you're practicing the three characteristics from that side and you don't get taught dependent origination, then you have an absence for the Dhamma. Because throughout the text, we keep hearing this echo. He who sees the Dhamma sees dependent origination. He who sees dependent origination sees the Dhamma. He who sees dependent origination sees the Buddha. So we can't get away from that thing. We have to remember it's there. Why was it put there? And this is why we can't leave the pieces out. You won't finish the puzzle if we do. Okay, so the, the next one, the next piece that I had on here to use was this one. Okay. Oops, I can't get it. Control to select multiple windows. Why is that doing that to me? <laughs> why are you doing that to me? I'm not sure. Oh, there we go. Okay. This little guy, I put this in here uh, 
uh, because this is in there. And I often tell you the Anumana Sutta was put in for the purpose of reminding the monks something. It doesn't seem to be there here, but it's mentioned in other places. But why were these, was this list given to us? So what is the list? It, it's um, the reason he did it to the, for the monks. He did it for anybody who reads it, but basically a teacher will suffer greatly if they try to spend, I just had a teacher as a matter of fact, uh, who was talking to me and who finally, you know, is suffering greatly in an American school where the children are abusive and disrespectful and it isn't regulated and there's not discipline anymore the way it was permitted before. And so there, nothing's replaced that. They just tried to eliminate all of it and they managed to. And so where does it leave the teacher with 26 kids in the room with three of them that just want to do whatever they please, yell, scream, dance, throw spitballs in the ceiling or anything they want and say whatever language they want to to a teacher. And what is that teacher supposed to do? And the teachers, the, the parents will get mad if you say your children were doing this and you don't like to say it, but you think maybe there should be a camera in the room. And if there's a bad situation, maybe after a while, we should have the parents come in and force them to sit in a room and watch their kids in class. But the parents, the problem, the problem is everything is out of balance right now. Look at the parents side of this, you know, uh, the parents want to have a decent living situation. They get competitive with their neighbor and there's all this greed and lust and all this stuff going on. Uh, greed, lust and delusion, you know, and then, and then in order to ha keep that house, when the mortgage rate changes, mom has to go to work too. So now dad's working and mom's to walk working. And, you know, guess what? They even made a law that if you're 16, you can't go in your own house if nobody's there, if you, you cannot lock your door and keep your child out, you better remember to give them a key to get in because you can get arrested if, if you set up a latchkey problem. If you let the child be there in the house alone up to 16, you know? And so uh, <laughs> I, I was in the city and I was in a big apartment complex as an assistant manager for a while. And I was, these latchkey kids are really sad. I mean, they want to be good, but we made rules. They can't rollers, rollerblade on the tennis courts. <laughs> and we made rules that they can't, um, you know, laugh and all this stuff here and there or race around. And we made all these rules to restrict them. But they come home, they can't even go inside legally if, if there's no one there to receive them. This is crazy. But anyway... Look at the situation is um, is a little off sides, it's out of balance. So this this anyway, this sutta is how long should a teacher have to put up with those children that are messing up the classroom? How long is he supposed to actually put out effort toward those children trying to make them learn something when they're so abusive to the teacher? And I said there should be, it, it should be illegal to be disrespectful and abusive to a teacher. It is in a prep school. It is in a private school. So in, in public schools, though, this is the doom of everything. You know, the teacher was just about ready to have a heart attack. He finally woke up sitting two or three times and listening what I was to him. It's all, all of it. First, it is impersonal. It is not me. It is not mine. It is not myself. It's all impersonal. You look very carefully at that. The second thing is nothing is happening to you. It's all happening from you. How are you going to process it? So where he went with the processing, he called me up. He says, I'm okay. Well, how did you get okay in 20, about 20, I think it's 48 hours, two days. How did you do that? And he said, I decided to accept the truth and not try to fight this truth and make it the way I want it to be. That's what's in the instructions for the meditation. He said, I can't do that with these children if the you know, administration is not going to help me and I, I have to have this job. And so I just decided they're nutty and uh, that's all there is to it. And I'm not going to put any effort into teaching outside the time I teach the subject or the part of it to the rest of the class, they're not going to get any special attention. And if they will let me de detain them or set up 
a divider in the room, I might be able to put them behind in a, a, a divider away from the sight of the other children. Maybe. This is an extremely bad this situation. But even if they, sh he says he knows, even if they told the parents the children were behaving like this, what would happen? He said they would deny it and their children couldn't possibly be like that, but they are. And the reason is because mom's not home, dad's not home. There really aren't parenting has caused a big crash because of this greed, hatred, delusion and competition to be the way everybody else is in the neighborhood and then have to keep it because you have to pay for it. You have to protect it. You have to have security systems and everything. When you get involved in all this material stuff, you have that's you bought it. Now you own it. Now let's see if you can keep it and protect it and secure it and pay for that too. So because all this is going on, where does it leave the natural flow of the parenting for the parents? That is the thing. What has happened to that? And so is the chil are the children totally, they're just actually, re you know, playing it through. And if nobody's home, they're just, how are they going to grow up? You, you're going to, however, if you, I've told people, stand in front of the mirror. You want to understand what's wrong with your children, stand in the front of the mirror for a while. If you heard it come out of their mouth, stand in front of the mirror and say, how many times did you say that to your husband or he said that to you? And then they heard it and then they started saying it. And how do you take responsibility when you say you're going to be at a school play and then you don't bother to get there? And you miss not only that, but the other one and the other one and the other. This is a big deal for children. They're going to imprint what you, and then later they don't come home on time. Well, I couldn't get to a phone. Well, I'm sorry. I forgot I had to be home at 10 o'clock. <laughs> well, well, there you go. I had just recently gone through something where, uh, you know, a young person, they set up a conference and we went to Thailand for the conference. And then the people that went there, we were angry. We, we did. We got angry because he disappeared the whole time we were at the conference. We thought we were going to be able to spend time with that person also. And then the, uh, when the thing was not going to, uh, you know, we were still going to be there for a while before we flew back. Um, and this was interesting because um, then one of the people who had been flown there for the conference turns around and says, well, I just went and bought a ticket to go see my teacher since I'm close to where he is anyway, and I'll get home on my own. Don't worry about me and just left. Now, that's what's interesting about this is the young man, he left and uh, this other person was really angry, left. But you know what? He had spent a lot of time with this person and that's where he learned how to do that. So he just left and didn't consider us, but then he left and he didn't consider us either. And he was mad at what the younger one had done, but he does the same thing. So we're not aware, we're not connected anymore. We're not together long enough beyond to say, hi, I'm home. Or we don't, do we really have conversations? Do we really have communications? That's what's interesting. We should have a class someday just on the methodology of communicating in relationships and talk about where does communication happen? How does it happen? Are short ones worth anything? Middle length ones, do they have to be long, et cetera, and so forth. What is it really about? And once you understand what it's about and learn how to do it, you can have a lot of fun and straighten it all out. But without that communication, what is the primary reason for a divorce to happen? One person in that situation is gonna say, you never listen to me. You never really sit down and talk to me. You never really communicate with me. So I found somebody who would. So listening becomes a big part of communication. And if we don't have that, well, then we're going to go find it somewhere else. All right, this next one is inference. And inference means it has this has to, I don't know where inference came from. You should look up that word, May, and tell me what it says on your phone. What the inference define inference, but it's inferring. I guess inferring is basically saying, um, where's my little book? You know, I don't think it's in here, but inference infers, and something that infers is pointing to something, right? So it's got to be.
I bet you it's not here. Uh, Sitra Kema, there is something online, uh, definition from Oxford. Yep. Go uh, ahead. What is that one? So it says it's a conclusion reached on the basis of evidence and reasoning. Oh, that's perfect. That's what this is. Exactly. So what this is, is reaching a decision based on evidence that you can see very clearly and you can test for yourself. Should a teacher, how much time should a teacher be spending with a student? And what he used to talk to the monks themselves uh, sometimes about when they, when they questioned him on this, he would make a point and when you're learning this, if you go out to teach and stuff like that, that you only have one life. And this stuff is important and we want to give it to the world, to humanity. So if you run into somebody that's going to suck you dry, I mean, pull everything out of you as a coach or a teacher or something like that, then the question is, is it worth it to you? How is it worth it to you to allow this person to do this? Or is it obvious that they are not going to cooperate with what you're saying and not learn? They're not learning and they're not going to be able to pass it on. So he's saying, what are we going to do with this? So he says to them, friends, though a monk asks thus, let the venerable ones admonish me. It means correct me if I'm with a group of monks or nuns. I need to be admonished by the venerable ones. And when we live in groups, that's how it works. We, do re we live in groups so somebody can talk to us once in a while about this or that, help us to iron things out that maybe isn't working so well when we're teaching, or maybe it isn't working, uh, you know, uh, the way that we're presenting or the information, the way we're putting it out, and they want to talk to us about it. Yet, if that person is difficult to uh, admonish, it's difficult to, to possess, uh, uh, to um, talk to them about this issue and coach them. It's difficult to coach them because they do not take the instruction rightly and then the companions in the, in the life together, they think that that person should be admonished or instructed and they think of him as a person not to be trusted because no matter how much time I spend with a person, I had a retreat where somebody, I spent a lot of time with this person and they just really ignored what I was saying and in the end did some really crazy things and the owner will never let them come on the property again, ever. And we worked hours with this person and at the end he said well didn't i improve i said well sure until what you did last night and that was the stupidest thing i ever saw well i don't know when i you know exactly where you're going and why and what happened and you're just going to have to take this for what it is when you do things you have to accept what you did and go through whatever it is but listen to what he did he said first if a, if the student we just say instead of monk you just say student so if the um, student has evil wishes and is dominated by evil wishes, then the quality makes him difficult to, to work with. Now you have to go into all this thing about what's evil, what's not, <laughs> and determine in each culture where you're going to go with that. But basically wholesome and unwholesome, okay? The next one is a monk lauds himself and disparages others, and the quality makes him difficult to to discuss this with him, you can't discuss him and can't help him change his mind. Okay, um, he doesn't listen to your instruction. This one gets angry and overcome by anger. This one is angry and resentful when you try to, because of the anger, he's resentful and won't allow you to correct him. This one is angry and stubborn because of the anger. Uh, the next one is angry. Um, uh, okay, he utters words bordering on anger back at the teacher. He's going to yell back at the teacher if, um, if he doesn't hear what he wants to from the teacher. And then you have a monk. A monk is, is reproved. You correct him and he resists the correction. He fights you or he denigrates the person who's trying to instruct him like what's happening to the teacher. You see, with the, the trying to teach them and then getting it back in the face and he's supposed to accept it. Well, he has to decide how much time he's going to spend teaching that person if that's what's going to happen. 
Then this one is he counter reproves the reprover. So you explain something to him and he's supposed to be your protege. He is supposed to be sometimes even paying the coach to tell him what to do. But what happens is he comes back and counters the person and reproves that person in a different way. This one's good. You, you try to correct him. And this one, he prevaricates. What does prevaricate mean? Prevaricate is like Richard Nixon. <laughs> <laughs> Richard Nixon in the 60s, uh, President Nixon was asked a question, and if he didn't want to answer it, but he wanted to sound intelligent and keep speaking, he would go like this, you know, here's the question on my nose, and I ask him the question, and he goes, Yes, there. And then he stops talking and he won't let the person say another word. He did it, he used to do it in the, in the interviews in the White House. He prevaricates, he goes to different subjects. He talked, about, I asked him, what I ask him, uh, aren't we using too much money to make missiles? Well, yeah, but we put this much in trucks and we put this much in housing and we did this much employment and we did this much for schools. He does that sort of thing, but he won't answer the question, you see? So that's a prevaricator. Okay, and then you have, um, he fails to account for his conduct for why he was doing this, which in the case of the teacher, why are, we know why they're misbehaving because of their home situations, but there's nothing we can do. And if their parents don't um, understand that this is what, what is happening, then how can that teacher, it's a very pitiful situation for a teacher who studied for years to learn to teach and likes teaching and can't teach. Very sad, okay? So he fails to account for his conduct and uh, that one doesn't work. He's insolent, contemptuous and insolent, meaning angry back. This one is envious uh, and avaricious. I can't remember avaricious, May. What's avaricious? Um, avaricious, I can't remember. Envious is like, you know, <laughs> what is aver avaricious? Um, these words, I love Bhikkhu Bodhi, I really do. <laughs> avaricious, let's see. It's not a hard word, but I just don't have it, you know. Uh, um, yeah. Avaricious, um, having or showing an extreme greed for wealth or material gain. So there, you're, you're talking about that. You're throwing that back in the person. Uh, envious and avaricious. Another one is fraudulent and deceitful. So he's not going to tell you the truth. This one is obstinate and arrogant. And then you had the one that adheres to his own views, holds on to them tenaciously, and relinquishes them with, with difficulty. Go to sutta number 72 in section 18. And, and that's when uh, Vajikati would not talk, stop talking about all different kinds of philosophies and things like that. He wouldn't listen to what the Buddha said. And he started, the Buddha explained to him what his problem was in that one. So then this one is, uh, though the student, all right, now we come to, these are the reasons why they can't succeed with the teacher. They just can't. But then if the person doesn't have those qualities, that's all I'm going to say here. I'm not going to read through the whole thing. But if he's not doing these qualities and in another sutta, he's basically pointing to the fact that if the student is doing, we figured it out one time, we tried to based on experience for two years. And I said, let's go over this while I was, we were in a layover in an airport. I started talking to him about it and he, he said, look, this one had three of them. This one had four of them. When they've got three or four of them, do you really want to keep pushing to teach that person when you can't break through? So you're just wasting your energy because it, like the man who recited the suit at the bottom of the steps of the temple and he didn't know what it even meant. So does he still want to do it, do it, do it? Well, he was feeling good and it probably calmed him down and he liked the sound of it, but that's as far as it goes. But as far as Dhamma goes, no, no, that's about it. <laughs> you know, just that's it. So when we look at this stuff, um, 
your all the elements that you're using. Oh yeah, okay. Another one is Nakalaputta, the Nakalaputta Sutta, um, and I can't remember where it is. I think it's in Samyutta Nikaya, and but it might be that there's one in the Majjhima Nikaya too somewhere. And the the story goes like this. Okay, there was a man, and his father got very ill, and the father almost died, and he was so upset about the idea of death. This is what was going on. He was so upset by the idea of dying, he had no, no resolution to death being normal. And he was torn up about it even when he didn't die. <laughs> you know? So the son decides to take him to the Buddha and have the Buddha talk to him. And the lesson is very simple. He doesn't talk to the Buddha very long. The Buddha just had one simple statement to one little tiny, his few sentences. And all it really meant was this, when the body is ill, when the body is injured or the body is ill, the mind is not ill. The mind is not sick. The body is sick, but the mind is not sick. The mind can be pure and open, can be healthy, can get through this by learning enough about what it takes to support the body to get through rehabilitation, to get through retraining, and to get physically back on your feet, okay? Or to make an adjustment to survive, to keep going when you've lost a limb or lost a leg or an arm. I don't get much upset about that anymore, that part, you know, because of Nick without legs and arms. If you've never gone to look, at, look up on the internet, Nick without arms or legs. And this is a special, this is a person who is when he's talking about this. He wanted to teach young people their ways are difficult for anything change your perspective looking at this and you can learn how to do things and have a really happy life and he gives to the whole world he has only one foot on the bottom of his torso and figured out how to get strong enough to jump up on a chair and to he's a wonderful presenter he's marvelous absolutely terrific and it's just outrageous. You know, how successful he's been, he got married. Um, he was a functioning male, he has a child. They have a house. He's very successful as a speaker. He has a person that travels with him. But um, he's overcome so much. And so where it puts a person is, where I am is not so much at all when I'm watching Nick, I can't go through anything because for Nick, he makes it possible for me to understand. You see, there isn't anything that you can't do and overcome, you see? And the biggest thing for us in, in uh, the last 20 years, in my opinion, is the neuro um, cognitive science that figured out the um, neural plasticity, the plasticity of the brain, the flexibility of it, you are not stuck. And if you believe you're stuck, you need to hang out with us for a while so you can learn how you're not stuck. You can change your mind. You can change everything about where you think you're stuck because you, it isn't, it's not impossible. You, because you turn the whole thing over. That's what we're doing, turning the whole thing over. And we're not saying it's absolute. I never tried it. I try not to say it's really absolute. I might say it absolutely works, <laughs> you know, because it went, it worked for me. It has worked for so many people. But the thing of it is, why don't you approach it this way? What if it really works? What if this stuff really works? See, we had come into this. I came in when I was 50 at 2000. And the thing of it is, <clears throat> the situation with the text and everything, although some wonderful people are studying the text and everything, but the general people need to understand something about this. Um, we're also, we talk about who's coming to Buddhism and curious about it, who's it coming to investigate Buddhism. We never point out who's leaving. That's sad. The people who are leaving are the ones who haven't figured out how it applies to life all the time. And the thing about Buddhism also is 
to me, I'm in a funny place. You know, I, I am a nun because I wanted to talk to all the people who were totally and completely in this. And that's what I do. And they, and we have fun talking about it almost anywhere I go. But I have times when I think it should be universal practice. It should be taught to all human beings. And the teaching I did in September was a wonderful chance for me to prove I could overcome that with a very strong Christian setup with teaching the nuns because by doing it with them successfully, teaching it to them, not as Buddhism, but as a way out. And I realized during that, that retreat, something very significant, the Buddha figured out the way out is in. <laughs> so the way out is in. So now I have two sayings to bug you. One is, when you come here, you are trying, if you want to say, what am I trying to do? You are attempting to experience an experience of no experience. That is what you're doing, okay? And what happens, you, you want to know what happens to my brain? If I leave all my past behind and I don't fall into any of that stuff anymore back there, and I leave all my worry for the future away, I don't spend time worry, 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 the what if itis, the infection of the what if part of your brain. If I don't, I'm not involved in that. And I'm not involved in over here, it's what I should have done, what I would have done, what I could have done, if only. But it doesn't matter because this right here is gone. And the energy that took it for that event is done. And if we should just learn that piece, we can stay in the present time. Because if we're not, we worry about the future. That energy is not here yet. So if you're worrying about the future, where is that energy coming from? Hmm. It's coming from today. And that one is coming from today too. So what's left for you? And why are you glum? Because you used it wrong. You were supposed to be using it in the present time. It doesn't mean you can't go over there in, you know, in the box and go through the box and look through, look through all these past memories. That's okay. You can do that anytime you want and, and read it and say, oh, that boy, did I learn a lesson about this here? <laughs> You can do that. That's fine. I didn't say throw away the value of the lessons that you learned in the past. I said, don't sit in a rocking chair and start thinking about it and just rocking there, lamenting over something that is actually fixed and done in the past. It's in the past. It's not in the lifeline right now. See, I said, don't take today's energy the universe gave you and fool around with mother nature and give it to the past and the future. Don't do that. She gave it to you for today. So this bit about energy and balance, and you know, one of the things that uh, about using, using the knowledge in, in what we're doing, how do we use that? We could probably go into another lesson with this, May, if we want to spend another weekend on it, we could, you know, we could send in, spend another Sunday on it. It's just taking, just taking the Four Noble Truths and looking how to arbitrate a situation, how to make peace out of a situation, a family conflict, a community issue, a world problem in a sensible way that doesn't lead to war. Looking at the dependent origination, the seven links about how you watch events happen one at a time in your life can explain to you why are things rough at home right now? Why is it difficult with my dad? Why is it difficult with my friends? Why is this happening? How, not why, but how did it happen? If I see, we have a secret in Buddhism. We said there were no secrets, but there's some things that you just stumble on that you have to discover. And one of the things that isn't point blank, it doesn't tell you probably in there directly, you change your mind, you change your life, but it's in a lot of suttas, isn't it? If you change your mind, you change your life. If you can go from unwholesome to wholesome, it changes everything. Doesn't it? Okay. It's basically the secret. <laughs> Senior moment, senior moment. <laughs> uh, 
Um, the um, it slipped. It went out. It's all right. Probably come back. The uh, well, I told you the only way out of it, out of the stress and the strain and the tension of everything, is to go in. Oh, I know what it was. I know what it was. There is a pattern of discovery. This is not. You have to see it repeated again and again and again in the sutras to find it. It's not put in your face like, here's a pattern, here's what it is. Because the Buddha is adamant about something. He is not going to give you the answer in this little package, like this little bowl. He's not going to give it to you. You have to discover it by practicing with the information he's giving you to, to find, unearth it, to uncover it. Okay? And in this situation, kind of what it is, um, <laughs> when and when, when again, jeez. Yeah, okay, I got it. Um, basically what it is, is the moment that you see how it works or the moment that you realize it isn't something that has anything to do with this lifetime. The moment you see that, the problem's gone. So what am I talking about? I'm talking about the fear of heights. And the moment that you get to the point where you realize this has happened because of some events in another lifetime that happened for a person, a bunch of different people at 50 years old. And all of a sudden at 50 years old, for no reason, I was afraid of heights. No reason. Nothing happened to, to me. There was no incident, no accident, no functional reason. And my whole life, I was climbing, climbing mountains, doing you know, everything, hang gliding, you know, flying small planes, ultralights, and, you know, kite sailing, uh, not kite sailing, but also kite surfing and things like this, all that stuff. I wasn't afraid of anything. And so all of a sudden, this fear comes up. And why did it come up? Because it happened somewhere else. And how did we get over it? I got over it by figuring out it happened to other people and somehow that came through, but the, but the, the fear came out all of a sudden, but the whole thing was over and just disappeared. As soon as you realize the source of it was what happened to me in other lifetimes before, or to whoever was in the other lifetimes before carried over that, that how do we, we can't explain how this works. But it popped in, the consciousness somehow pops up at that same age as those people were dying. And once you track that and you know, wow, it has nothing to do with this lifetime, it disappears. And um, there's evidence in some of the suttas where it, the, the phrase is actually there. I want to look at 128 to see if that was it. The moment I realized that was the place where I saw this first, I, I really understood it was like being applied all over the place. So in 128, in the end of that sutta, the very last, um, it's the statement is, I understood that the doubt was an imperfection. And that, and so he abandons it. He, he abandoned the imperfection, but he couldn't abandon it until he realized it was an imperfection. Do you understand? Okay. So the moment he sees that, so what were the ones in 128? What was it concerned with? Sloth and torpor was in me. And as soon as I understand that was an imperfection and was going to stop my meditation, I let go of sloth and torpor. Fear arose in me. That's the one I just said. Elation arose in me. And inertia arose in me. They were on page 1013, 1013. Excess energy, that arose in me. Deficiency of energy. Longing arose in me. And perception of diversity arose in me. And excess meditation, meaning too much meditation. I didn't take a break. I grabbed onto it and wanted to do, go, go, go. I, it, it imbalanced my life. And the moment I realized that's an imperfection to imbalance your life. For instance, the person that's keeping five precepts, they decide to live like a monk, very hard to do. Uh, but not only hard to do, very disturbing and in, not compassionate at all for the people in the family or the people around you to try and do that when you're actually in a situation and a um, reality 
for everybody else. And with them and cause disruption. It's unkind. It's not compassionate. So it's like sort of wanting them to help you do this without explanation. So anyway, so when uh, we can do this next week, we can take the Four Noble Truths and do the arbitration thing where we show you how to do a settlement between people arguing or disruption where everybody's not getting along in a household or a team of workers who are doing innovative invention type stuff and they not working well together, how do we get them to work more smoothly? These are all applying the Four Noble Truths in a way where you look, you use the truths and just tune it a little differently. And you're using the truths to figure out what is the suffering? What is the cause? What is the cessation? And how are we going to get out of the suffering we're causing in the group, you know, in the legislature, <laughs> in the world? <laughs> and, and then this encompasses all the things you can think about when you talk about life, school, college, training, professional uses, um, CEOs, CFOs, the upper administrative group, proposals uh, of projects, all these things we talked about, family, community, um, medical issues, science, innovation, all these things. When you run into difficulties for yourself and the person who is with you, how do you solve it? And that's where you apply the Four Noble Truths. You got any questions? I think we need to stop now because I have to rest a tiny bit before I do a six o'clock thing tonight. So anybody have any questions about what we're doing? And always remember about me, remember, please. When you pull the film up, set it for the speed of 0.75. <laughs> I sound pretty good at 75 and it doesn't make it go that much longer. Uh, but it really helps you to be able to understand me completely. It's my Eastern seaboard, uh, Eastern East Coast, speedy, speedy, speedy stuff, you know. That's what it is. Our whole family was like this. Okay. So you know what a Jabberwocky is, right? <laughs> yep. Okay. Everybody okay? Yeah. Everett, go ahead for me. Uh, yeah. So with the uh, sutta number 95 mm -hmm. and about yeah. all the, the steps it, is that like a um does that circle around as well so all the steps just like dana shila bhavana that goes in the circle pretty much yeah that okay. like i was saying it what goes around comes around yes yeah. Yeah, okay, that's where you can take any of these things that are helping you to see how you can handle things. The circle was put like uh, in the Donna, Sila, in the Donna, for instance, when you, you don't want to give to people, let's say you're a person that really gets off on giving to the monks the food and that they're thinking that merit is everything. So I'm going to get as much merit as I possibly can. But what they experience is the more that they give of the four requisites, food and housing and clothing and medicine to the monks, actually the better they personally feel. So there's this, what goes around comes around. And then you take things like loving kindness, compassion, joy, equanimity. You start putting that out, it will start coming back to you. And the payback is it will come back. You have students you're teaching if you're kind to them and gentle. And if you're doing that enough and praising them in ways they never, Part of the problem with latchkey children is they never hear appreciation for what they're doing. Um, you know, when they never get the time to talk with their parents because when their parents come home, they're worn out and they want to talk to each other. And a lot of times the kids never have this time to be appreciated for what they're trying to do in school. And then they go in other directions. So that you can't really scream uh, what the teacher basically decided the solution to this thing was to agree that they're nutty and they're going to stay nutty and I can't stop them from staying nutty. So I have to work, just keep going. I still, you know, my thing is if I was there, I would still try real hard to figure out if there isn't any way to separate them from the rest of the class 
if they can't be corrected and they can't come back, come balanced somehow, is it really fair for the three to be in a class of 30 kids to take everything away from those kids because of the disruption? And if we can't figure out a way to do that kind of thing, uh, I'm not sure what the answer is. In, in the country where I was, uh, in the, that when I mean country, out in the country where I was in the Northeastern United States, we would put them into trade school. Yeah, we would take them out of the high school and put them in the trade school and not have them in the college prep courses. They're out, they're out, they're, do, they're doing, uh, and it's not a bad deal. You can learn plumbing and all about cars and industry and woodworking and all these things are still able to be taught in trade school divisions. And if they uh, do that, they can make a very nice living if they do it, you see? So, but ever to answer your question, the circle was going around in karma here, but is also going uh, around even if you were to give merit and it comes back, but then you get down into actual action with the comma, which is the, the comma of just anything you do, generosity, you take it, extend it into, are you generous to the people at work? You, if you put out, then the coworkers are gonna come back to you. If you have people under you, the best leader is not the captain of the supernova. <laughs> It's not the, you know, it's not the general type military person, but it's a person that is very clear and this is what needs to be done. Now let's do it. Yeah. But you can, one of the things you can be the most popular leader of any team is to put them in a circle and ask each one of them what they think is wrong in five words. Just what do you think is wrong? And if you get it, you know, all of them, what they think the actual craving is, this is what we can talk about next week. I don't want to keep going. <laughs> you know, I can show you how to do it with a, with a group problem where if you, you include them in your decision-making on how you're going to take action. So that when you announce the action you're going to take, they hear their input in your decision that you're giving to them. That makes you king of the kings. Really, it really does. Because that way... They know that you are listening to them. You're not just doing it because it's said to do it in some book, listen to them and you're gonna do it anyway, the way you wanna do it. You, you begin to feel you are listening. I mean, I had a boss once and anything I brought to that person, they put it down the moment I suggested it. it made me feel like I never wanted to do it again. I never wanted to try to be creative or, um, you know, it was the same effect as why don't they ask questions in Sri Lanka? Because when they were the uh, colonies, they were told to be quiet and do exactly what they were told. And that went into the DNA and it comes out the other end and it's still there. To a large extent, people are very quiet and silent and will not suggest anything because they were put down for centuries by the Dutch and the Portuguese and the English, okay? So once it's there, how do you overcome this? You have to change your school system. You have to get the seniority group out. You have to get new teachers in that are taught in a way that they want questions and then ask them to dive in and really try to re-stimulate the questioning because that's where the knowledge comes from. That's how you get smart, okay? Hallelujah, <laughs> okay. Okay, so let's say our prayer. And we'll come back next week, bring questions for this week, okay? And we'll do it again, okay? May suffering ones be suffering free and the fear struck fearless be. May the grieving shed all grief and may all beings find relief. May all beings share this merit that we have thus acquired for the acquisition of all kinds of happiness. May beings inhabiting space and earth in heaven all these places, devas and nagas of mighty power share this merit of ours. May they long protect the Buddha's dispensation. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Bye-bye. I'll come back. Yep. 
I can call you, okay? I'm here. I can call you. Okay. I'm just running out to grab a coffee. I'll be back in a few minutes. Okay, cool. Okay, thank you. <laughs> 